This is Hacker Public Radio episode 3549 for Thursday the 10th of March 2022. Today's show is entitled, Linux in Los S01E51, Git and Static Site Generators and is part of the series, Linux in Los. It is hosted by Monochrome, and is about 53 minutes long, and carries an explicit flag. The summary is, Git and Static Site Generators. is Linux in Laws, a podcast on topics around free and open source software, any associated contraband, communism, the revolution in general, and whatever else fancies your tickle. Please note that this and other episodes may contain strong language, offensive humor, and other certainly not politically correct language. You have been warned. Our parents insisted on this disclaimer. Happy mum! Thus, the content is not suitable for consumption in the workplace, especially when played back on a speaker in an open plan office or similar environments. Any minors under the age of 35 or any pets, including fluffy little killer bunnies, your trusted guide dog, unless on speed, and cute T-Rexes or other associated dinosaurs. Welcome to Linux in Laws Season One. <laughs> Definitely Season episode, One. <laughs> <laughs> episode Fifty One. Yes. <laughs> oh, you've well done. You, know, you got the number. Well done. Perfect, Martin. How are things tonight? Ah, uh, damp and drizzly, but uh, damp. Yeah. Can't, yeah can't I, let me guess. You're still li- you're still living in this splinter country called the uh, Kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> I think because, you're it's, it's, is your audio playing up again? <laughs> I mean, you can't really call this United anyway because it's going to break up for any any moment. As soon yeah, as as sure Lizzie is gone, sure. and bless her by the way, your your kingship. Because I think we are recording this in what is it? February. February twenty. 22. No, no, no. Hang on, Martin. This is twenty twenty five, and she's been okay. in office now for for what? 112 years or something like this, right? No. So, Lizzie, if you're listening, well done. <laughs> yes. Yes, you see. Pretty tough, aren't they? No, of course, we're calling this in 22, and she's just, what is it? She's been in office now for 20, for 70 years, right? Yes, that's right. That's right. There is a change in the public holidays here this year for... Martin, you are the monarchist... Uh, of of the two of us, so you Am should I? know. Yes, you are. Well, it, it comes uh, with the it. Hang on, it comes with the heritage. Is it? Okay. Um, some people call it for, uh, to, to get from the from the frying pan right into the fire <laughs> because you you move from Holland to, to to something called England. Well, they're both monarchies. Yes, this is true. Indeed, <laughs> indeed, they are. They they used to have some nutters in Germany as well, didn't they? But, um... Yeah, but this was before we invented communism back in the what thirties uh, or something. <laughs> I remember one of them they um, they shipped off to Holland in the uh, early nineteen hundreds, didn't they? And this is where the well, trouble started, I well, suppose. Very right? popular, yeah. So yes, just you're, you're safe blaming it all on all on the Germans. That's okay, no worries. Just do it. <laughs> Oh, it's uh, they, they never mind things. whether you are <laughs> never mind whether you're of Dutch origin or living in England. Just blame it on the Germans. Always works. <laughs> well, they started it after all. <laughs> Indeed, they did. That's for a faulty time. You see, anyway. you might, when you when you think about it, uh, the, the the Netherlands are just a splinter, as in a breakaway country of something mm. called the Great German Nation. No. It's, Maybe I'm wrong. Um, Historians, if you're listening, the the email address uh, is feedback at Linux in laws are you? Yeah, I'm sure that was mentioned in history lessons in the past. But, uh, yeah. Maybe I got things yeah, wrong. We are all Germanic <laughs> peoples, right? This is I think, indeed the, very the much the clan so. or the, the group, or in, the, including yeah. including the the Anglo Saxons and, and all the rest of them. Uh, not sure about the Anglo Saxons. They're not Germanic people, are they? 
Well, wait, why would English the, then be an Germanic yeah. language, come to think of it? Because they're Saxon and stuff like that. Yeah, but short, they short all language. go back to a common origin, <laughs> no? Language-wise, anyway. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess English is part of the same I mean, you too. see, there's a vicious group of people around saying that Dutch is essentially a mixture of English and German going back about a thousand years or something. Well, no, 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 you got that. No, 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 you got that wrong. The root, this is the incorrect one. So, the, in fact, it's German who is the derivation of Dutch. But, um, yeah, this is... Um, how a, many people... A lesser-known fact. <laughs> how many How many people did your historians have to bribe for this? <laughs> I'm just checking. The facts in the show, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Historians, if you're still alive and can can tell the and 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 tell and, and and can tell the the real story in terms of how much mood I had, it really costs. The email address is is, is um how to bribe a nation at linuxinlaws.eu. Just send a mail and we'll get yeah. you on the show. Sounds good. All right. Uh, anyway, but yes, tonight, of course, we have a special guest. Yes, <laughs> it's us. <laughs> Oh, no, you had a special guest. Then. <laughs> For a change, we're just doing a, a duo episode as Martin and myself. Yes. But you're going to tell us all about static side generators, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and and, I, and I'm afraid you're going to ask the questions, right? That's a little that. scary that's about it. That's, that's <laughs> not a problem. That's a problem. Okay, um, Ken, if you're listening, and I'm sure you are, this is been waiting for the for a while. Yes, <laughs> exactly. This, this, is, this is your episode. As the other Avid listener will recall, there was an episode in 2021 where we interviewed our sponsors, namely mm-hmm. Public Radio, in the shape of a janitor called Ken Fallon. And we mentioned the way uh, of how to set up a website in the modern world using a static, a static site generator in terms of moving away from CMS system as in content management systems. And uh, the advantages, let's put it this way, of how a static site generator works and how it basically integrates to the version and control system because mm-hmm. HPR has this sort of thing in the making for a long time, but apparently Ken and friends haven't just gotten around to implementing it. Uh-huh. So this is a little bit of a word of advice in terms of how to do it, maybe how, of, maybe also of how not to do it, and maybe some of the caveats and maybe some of the tricks and benefits of how, of how, yes, of um, how to do this. Yeah, you, you set this up for the... Uh, user group in Frankfurt? Yes, the Linux user group. Yeah, exactly. We did it about a year ago, maybe one and a half years ago. Yes, in contrast or to our normal episode, this will be quite a long episode. We are editing this probably down to an hour. Oh, uh, maybe quite maybe quite two, quite. finally. Sorry, HPR will edit this down to two, ah. down to two hours. The original no, episode no, no, will no, probably last about some, five hours. Some music to the... Yes, make it longer. <laughs> um, uh, they normally do. Yes, no jokes aside, we keep the shot rather short and sweet. Needless to say, people, if you have questions um, or any general comments on this, mm. maybe you know a better way of how to do things. The email address is feedback at linuxinlaws.eu. Okay. So, Martin, why don't you get us started with telling us a little bit about the current challenges of something called delivering content to the greater masses. Why don't you start with a couple called Adam and Eve? <laughs> hmm. Okay. Uh, we could do, but it may be quite a long story. Um, we do have the time. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure Adam and Eve had any requirement for site generators or sites in that, in that uh, matter altogether. Um, okay. They had other things on their mind at the time, I'm sure. Apparently, apparently Martin is not game. <laughs> <laughs> to, to let us in on the full story, so why don't we give? A, why don't we start with giving the um, appreciated audience a little bit of an overview of how things were done in the past? Let's start with the notion of a content of a legacy content management system, as in what a CMS really is. So, Martin, uh, what is a CMS really? Well, as the name says, it's a content management system. <laughs> excellent, excellent. We're making progress. Very good. <laughs> okay. Well, you can imagine. Um, Take a uh, a new site like I don't know, BBC, for example, right? Um, they have a lot of content um, that gets uh, added uh, on a very regular basis, um, and 
clearly you don't want to end up um well sorry I'm, I'm making some some jumps here but all this can, content um has to be easily managed and uh, easy to can be easily added in a automated way right you don't want to end up typing a bunch of html to create a new new story every time uh, some news happens um so that's just really the role of the content management system is to automate that piece where content is just delivered in uh, text plus pictures and the cms takes care of producing that in a consistent uh, sort of uh, formats that uh, applies to the uh, let's say the, the 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 rules and the formatting and the view that the site is trying to represent uh, in a sort of couple of sentences. Martin has yeah that's that was very spot on. Martin Martin has captured quite a few elementary traits of a CMS. First of all, a CMS takes care of producing contents most of the time dynamically, i.e. somebody as a reporter or something like that goes to the site, enters the content, in, typically in a markup language like Markdown, HTML, you name it. And then the content management system takes care of the rest, i.e. taking this markdown, translating this into, into HTML and pumping this to the internet. The trouble, of course, it that takes time. In addition to this, CMSs normally have a role-based access control model in terms of not everybody is allowed to edit the overall site. Some people are just allowed to enter content, but do not change the structure of the site as such. Some people are only allowed to view the content as in maybe proofreaders and then feed the feed the corrections back to the original journalist or something like this. And of course, there are also administrators who can administer the site, i.e. change the structure, change the layout, change the templates and all the rest of it. So normally, CMSs are quite complex beasts in terms of setting things up, resource consumption, network bandwidth and all the rest of it. Typically, these content management systems I'm just I'm just mentioning a few examples here, like Joomla, like Typo3, like Drupal, were written in a scripting language. Uh, not to forget, of course, more and more in like Python, uh, like, like an example for the from the Python space. But normally, were were written in a program language that was dynamically invoked as part of a web server deployment, like Apache Engine, Engine X, you name it but had the disadvantage of really being very resource intensive disk wise as in disk capacity wise cpu wise and all the rest of it plus the fact that for each and every page invocation if the content management systems wouldn't cache the contents the contents had to be regenerated from the markdown that somebody entered and as you can imagine, this is quite a time-consuming process. Hmm. So deploying a CMS, running a CMS on your typical server infrastructure was quite was quite resource-intensive. So that's the reason. But of course, there were also a couple of benefits to the CMSs. Like most yeah. of the CMSs would support versioning. So if we're, if a journalist will, would go into the CMS, would type up an article, then this would be proofread then the proofreader would feed back uh, any corrections to the journalist. The journalist would automatically work, work on a second version of the content and so forth. But Martin, you had a question, interjection, or amendment. Yeah, so, so I mean, why don't you name some typical CMSs, right, that people will know and be familiar with? Martin, I just did. Did you doze off again? You didn't mention any names. Drupal, Joomla, oh, Joomla yeah, but Moin the, Moin. The most, most obvious one is something like a WordPress, right? That's, um... well, yes, Martin. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, you did. Yeah. So, Martin, what is WordPress then? Tell us all about it as you're running a couple of WordPress sites. It's just an example of a content management system. <laughs> Very good. I'm sure everybody is familiar. It's with probably, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. It's say yeah because I'm I'm the weirder of the two of us. I normally start with the most complex things, whereas Martin normally takes care of the simple of the simpler examples. Exactly. No, if, uh, jokes aside, people. WordPress 
it's probably fair to say that WordPress has been one of the primeval, for want of a better expression, uh, CMS systems. So it started out as a simple blogging system, but over time, it, it actually it, it, it evolved into full-blown content management system over the years. Because you can get plugins, you have different editors at your disposal, and the rest of it. Um, okay, so how does this relate to static site generators? I was just getting there, Martin. Okay. <laughs> now, the, now the problem, of course, is with the <laughs> exactly with the with the traditional CMS approaches. Is as I said, they're pretty they're they're pretty expensive. They're complex beasts, hard to maintain, and slow. Not too sure what 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 uh, CMS the BBS runs. Do you know this? I think they have at least a couple of WordPress sites out, right? Mm. Uh, yeah. I Maybe I'm wrong. What, what they have in total, but uh... Uh, B, 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 BBC, if you're listening, the email address is feedback at Linux in Los Angeles. We can sign NDAs if required, so just please get in touch. It's a little bit tricky with the podcast, though, isn't it? <laughs> it's, just, it's a very sort of silent episode. <laughs> Well, we have been known to be censored before. I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, that's all there was this Microsoft episode that never was released, right? But let's not digress anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Anyway, uh, going back to the much more important topic of static chart generators. So quite a people finally got around to, well, I wouldn't say noticing the deficiencies or the shortcomings of these traditional CMS systems, but clearly, but we're clearly looking for an alternative. That brings us back to the luck story. Moin Moin, which is a Python-based CMS, has been or had been in production rather before we put this to rest, as in sunsetted it, for at least ten years. And the local Linux user group that I'm helping out with. It was, or it is, actually written in Python 2. The problem was that, as probably most of the dear listenership knows, Python 2 went out of, ex- I wouldn't say out of existence, but went out of support, that's probably the better expression, early 2020. So no security upgrades, hmm. no uh, further versions. Actually, there's a pep, there's a pep out for it called Funny enough, PEP 404 published... Uh, sorry, PEP, of course, means Python Enhancement Proposal. It's an RFC-like process where uh, the Python community actually uh, works on furthering the language. So links will be in the show notes. It's essentially a collection of improvements for the language and its ecosystem. Covered. Touch yes. On the Python episode. We, we did indeed. So if you want to know the further details, just go back to the Python episode. Links will not be in the show notes, so you have to go back to the back catalog now to search for it. Mm-hmm. Or use your or use your favorite search engine to find this episode. Uh, the corresponding PAP is 404, published I think in 2008. Links may be in the show notes. Where Guido von Rossum, who is the Python inventor, who is who is the original Python inventor, and friends said there won't be any two uh, any Python two point eight release, so Python two died essentially with version two point seven. That yeah. was in twenty nineteen. Mm-hmm. Now the drawback with Moin Moin was actually that they had started the Py- a Moin Moin port version two. From Python three, or from Python two to Python three, uh-huh. but there were a couple of dependencies that were never really ported. So, because our I, I was one of the maintainers of the CMS systems for the for, uh, of the CMS system for the local log, I took a look in that was around twenty eighteen time frame, give or take, at the remaining packages that hadn't been ported to Python three, and simply said. In 2019, I'm going to take a stab at it and port the remaining packages from Python 2 to Python 3 so okay. that the project could close this delta and then move on to a full-blown Moin Moin version 2 with proper Python 3 support. Oh, now, it really, it? Yeah. Sorry? They should have called it uh, Moin Moin 3, but yeah, sorry, carry on. Well, they didn't. <laughs> um, but then life hit, and I didn't have any time in 2019 to conclude this effort. We, the luck as an 
we then were facing the issue that Python 2 was going out of support and we wanted to move the website to something different. So we checked out quite a few okay. um, CMSs, but none of them fit, would fit the bill. And then yeah. some hipster, a member of the luck, came up with this notion of a static ch- site generator. Oh. Okay. So, Martin, why don't you tell us what you know about static site generators in contrast to CMSs? Hmm. Well, as the name says, um, it is no longer, and well, you've already alluded to this, it's no longer uh, a dynamic process of generating a page when the demand is uh, occurs for uh, content. Uh, it's all pre-built, right? So you have uh, content templates and uh, pre-built into, um, the, the generator does the generation of the HTML for the, uh, whatever is going to be requested beforehand. And so it's when the request is made, it's just purely serving up um, the page rather than doing the dynamic version uh, that CMS does. And that concludes today's episode. Thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> no, Martin spotted it actually quite well. <laughs> no, Martin, I couldn't have name for this. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, I mean, no, no. I mean, you missed a few days, but essentially, <laughs> that's that's pretty much it. So, the idea going back to so, so comparing now CMSs to 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 setting search generators. That's exactly what Martin said. Essentially, CMSs regenerate the page based on, on, on requests, but a static site generator simply takes the markdown. Pretty much, it's, it's like the, it's like comparing an, an interpreter like Python to a compiled language like Rust or hmm. C. Yeah. So a static site generator basically takes the markdown and converts this into, into HTML and CSS, of course, as in cascading side sheets, which essentially is the templating engine behind, behind, or, or sorry. Uh, not the not the templating engine. What's what I'm looking for? Style sheet mm. uh, language, i.e., what gives HTML the looks. Let's put it this way: simplified version, and generates these based on the Markdown language that it's presented with. So you take the Markdown language, you take some templates, uh, you fit this into a static chart generator, and out comes CSS files and HTML files. You put this onto a web server, and then you have a static site that can be delivered to browsers lightning fast because you don't have to generate the content on the fly like a CMS does, but rather it's pre, it's pre-built, it's pre-defined, and it can be delivered statically. And that's the big difference between the traditional CMS and static chart generators. Of course, a static chart site generator misses a very important feature. It doesn't do versioning. And it doesn't have any notion of users, access control, and all the rest of it. So quite a few smart people came to the notion of, or came up with the idea of combining a versioning control system that has all these traits or features and actually a site generator. Meaning you version, you use your version control system and as part of the commit, Push, we push, uh, push process, whatever you want to call it, based on your particular, CR, uh, based on your particular versioning system, it regenerates the static website on the fly. That's the general idea behind combining a version control system and a static site generator. Needless to say, the Luck Frankfurt wasn't the first one or wasn't the first group that came up with the concept. Interest, it's a tried and tested concept. It has been done before quite a few times, but we simply borrowed the idea and never gave it back. Uh, so what we did, we combined something called Gitea, which is essentially a Git front end, like GitLab, like GitHub on a commercial basis, and something called Yugo, which is a static chat generator written in Go. Quite a few people looked at other approaches like what's it called? Lecter, it's Python based, something like Pelican, also Python based, and a number of other approaches. Okay. But Yugo made the mark in terms of convincing with speed, uh, resource efficiency, and at the end of the day, uh, easy, easiness of use. 
So what we did is essentially we set up the Gitea instance. Of course, we'll, links will be in the show notes. We set up the Gitea instance. We defined the users. We defined the the rights of the users, as in who is access to the repository, who can clone the repository, who also has has right access in terms of pushing any 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 request as an as an as an pull request back to the site, and then a so-called webhook. I'm going to explain what that is in a minute. Takes care on each and every delta check-in of a, of the modified content of regenerating the web uh, the website on the fly. A webhook, and this is pretty well documented actually in the Git documentation, but also in the derivatives like Gitea and so and so forth, or GitLab for that matter. A webhook essentially allows you to incorporate. I'm tempted to say plugins before a commit, after a commit, and during a commit. What we essentially did is we told Gitea, now look, if somebody with an SRS, of course, pushes back a change to the server, take this change and rerun Yugo on the fly. Meaning that essentially a contributor can modify the website based on his local copy, which he or she has, or it, because we are inclusive, has <laughs> generated on the fly by simply cloning the website. He can then use a light HTTP Nginx or even Apache instance on his local laptop or machine to try out any changes before committing it. Once he or she or it is satisfied with the changes, he simply commits and then uh, does a push to the GTA server. And as part of this push, authorized, of course, Yugo is invoked and regenerates the website on the fly. And that's pretty much it. Excellent. So, a question here. The, is is the webhook piece the the extra bit that Gitea delivers you over any other version control system? Uh, no, actually, um, okay. Git or, or Git already defines webhooks. Hmm. So, full disclosure: when Martin did the, our beautiful website, um, I. Really supplied, funny. yeah. I supplied yeah. the, I supplied the, I supplied the Git instance. Hmm. And if you take a look at Linux in-laws at EU, we do not use a static site generator. So we actually, or yeah, we actually hack the website ourselves. So we edit the HTML code, and I'm always tempted to say some scripts that also take care of the HPR automation do also hack the website. But uh, maybe details in a in a future show, depending. But the point is, once either Martin, myself, or any script does a git commit, a webhook also runs on our server and essentially incorporates that change into the server side HTML. So a webhook is already present in Git. It's not GitHub specific. It's not GitHub specific. It's going GitLab specific. It's just a matter, it's just a piece of automation, plugin based that runs as part of the overall push infrastructure. Okay. So, yeah. So, why don't you remind the listeners of the benefits of Gitea in this case? In contrast to native Git, Gitea has a beautiful web based UI, has a sophisticated admin panel in terms of role control. You can create roles, you can create users, you can attach roles to users, you can administer users and all the rest of it. It's 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 oh, pretty it's, uh, it's, very, it's very comparable to GitLab in that matter. Hmm. As in the community edition you can download from gitlab.com or whatever it's called these days. Mm -hmm. And this is, of course, the thing that we needed because not everybody in the luck is really that familiar with the command line. And it also allows people to, and this is the beauty, and this is also, this is also present on GitHub or other infrastructure, mm. uh, infrastructures, is actually it allows you to modify a file on the fly. So in contrast to the ordinary workflow where you clone a repo, then you make any changes, 
and then you say commit, and then you say um, push origin or push master or something like this, you can actually go into the web front end, go down to the file if you have particular if you have the corresponding permissions, and change the fly, uh, and, sorry, and change the file on the uh, using your browser. So what Gitean then does in the background, it will actually do a clone of the of of the of the repo will modify the file based on your inputs, will do a commit and a push pretty, pretty much automatically. That saves you, of course, doing this manually on the command line and also occupying or reserving space on your local hard drive. Uh, this is a little known feature that, as far as I know, most, if not all, of the web-based source, uh, um, um, of the web-based Git, clones like Gitea, GitLab, and GitHub do, or offer more or less pretty much these days as an out-of-the-box. Now, for, for Canon friends, um, you mentioned Hugo. Uh, how, what can you say about that in terms of ease of use? That uh, You mentioned it's based on Go and, and stuff like that. Do people need to know Go, for example, to be able to use it, or... What was the um, experience with that part? If you want to know, yeah, if you want to use Hugo, um, all it takes about 20 years of Golang experience, no? So you should be able to use it on the fly. <laughs> Given the fact that has that Go has been in existence only for the last 15, that's a bit of a, that's a, bit of a conundrum, isn't it? <laughs> no, I'm joking. Hugo is actually part of the most of oper of operating system repositories so you can start you can install it using your own package manage management system mm -hmm. if for some reason it's not part of your os repos simply clone the code base from github i think it is links will be in the show notes and simply build it yourself now go has come a long way similar to rust i might add a long way since in its since it, it's its inception in terms of building a, a a a an executable, so all you have to do is basically you have to invoke I think it's called Go Build or something like this in the cloned repo. It pulls down any dependencies, compiles it on the fly on the machine where you are on, similar to Rust, and then builds a statically linked executable, also similar to Rust. So that means within no time you have a fully functioning Go at your disposal. Go is pretty powerful. If you take a look at the documentation, it's pretty well documented, has its own templating engine and all the rest of it, but also supports a pretty powerful macro language that, for example, allows you to execute scripts as part of the generation phase of your website. Okay. We use this actually to incorporate, for example, JavaScript code in the statically generated website and some other magic. So it's pretty powerful, and it can be pretty easily extended, but that goes for most of the static uh, such generators. Okay, so it sounds like you can get um, you can get by with the macro language instead. Is that fair to say? I mean, they they pretty much work like I mean. I'm, I'm almost tempted to say they are like Python-based web front ends. They are like CMSs. They are like any other framework that you use, or right. even women or cars. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, uh, the way it works, essentially, once you know one, pretty much you know them all because they're very similar. I mean, cars may have different colors, may have different wheel types and sizes and all the rest of it. But essentially, cars get you from A to B. Same goes for women, same goes for... No, sorry, women, of course, don't get you from A to B, but you get rid of it anyway. Uh, static chart generators are pretty, much, are, are pretty similar in terms of they take a markdown language, take a template, take a template that you normally also define in in a type of markdown language and then simply generate your CSS and HTML files. Any hate myths with regards to uh, my previous remarks about gender? Um, <laughs> what's the word I'm looking for? Gen gender equality, exactly. Yeah. Um, please send that to Martin Visser at... <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, jokes aside, this is an all-inclusive show. Martin, Martin, of course, is now free to make any any, any non-chauvinistic jokes. 
<laughs> you, you're stuck with the chauvinistic ones, right? <laughs> I'm afraid so. Yes. No jokes aside. Um, it's uh, and, and I mean the 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 upside is it, it may sound complicated, but at the end of the day, it's not because the way you normally do it, or the way we actually did it, uh, mm. we we pulled uh, we pulled can, down. Interrupt. Yes. Can you, why don't you tell people how long it took you to go from where you were before to implementing this piece? Well, just give people some idea about how much effort it took you guys about half an hour <laughs> okay well, then, 50, then 50 minutes for QA <laughs> and then we were off to the races to the no jo- jokes <laughs> jo- jokes jo- jokes jokes aside uh, so maybe I should share some light on, on how we did it we you go like any other static judge side generators comes with comes with a few examples that gives you basically a quick start in terms of how the how a site works what you have to take into consideration, how the templating works, and all the rest of it. So it's not that it's not that hard. So what we did, we took an existing example and simply took the content that we exported from Moin Moin, and that gave us at least the content in a somewhat HTML-based fashion. We then did some automation with regards to translating the existing content to the markdown that you will require, made the changes to the templating engine, did some layout improvements, f- tr- migrated the macros, as in the stuff, basically the, the, the Python-based macros from the Moin Moin to, uh, from the Moin Moin side to the Yugo-based equivalents that pretty much meant rewriting about Six scripts, something like this. Six, six Python scripts in okay. into into PHP shell and some other scripts that are invoked as part of a Yugo static site gener- static site generation pro- um, process. So essentially, these are the 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 the, the macro definitions you put in your site. You put into your site, and as part of these macros, you would detect these macros once it comes across them and invokes. The corresponding plugins. It sounds complicated, but at the end, but at the end of the day, it's not. It's pretty straightforward. We have about I'm tempted to say about thirty pages from the old website. It took us about I reckon in total about a man month, not even full time. So I reckon within within three weeks, two to three weeks full time, the whole content had been translated. The macros had been converted as in migrated, as in translated. The uh, layout had been migrated and the site had been QA'd as in tested. Yeah, nice, nice. Um, and presumably you're going to put the link to the website in the show, uh, show notes? Absolutely. Mm. Okay. So the point that I'm making is, never mind of of what static site generator you cho- you choose. Simply give it a spin. They are not that hard to set up, and most of them. I looked at Pelican. Hmm. Somebody else looked at Yugo. Um, somebody somebody else again looked at other site generators. We agreed upon using Yugo, but then once that decision had been had been made, um, the learning curve was, I reckon, a weekend. And then you were off to the races. Nice, nice. Okay, excellent. So, Ken, take note. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> is, well, mind you, there's probably a few more pages on HPR, but uh, <laughs> uh, still no, looking fine. looking at the HTML code on HPR, it shouldn't be too difficult. Yeah, no, so, sure. so, Ken, get in touch with yep. cheap. Sorry. <laughs> We have a very good cost uh, efficiency ratio. That's what I'm trying to say. Anyway, okay, Martin, <laughs> any 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 final questions before we get to the sponsoring feedback and some other sections? No, I think that was a very nice um, summary on the subject. So well done, and uh, check out the um... the links in the show notes. Yes, yeah, indeed. And that brings us nicely to the feedback. feedback so, Martin, yeah. yes, why don't you give it a shot? Since I've been doing all the talking tonight, <laughs> I guess that's only fair. Um, mind you, it is quite a long. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we have feedback on three episodes in one, uh, as in from from who? 
from uh, Biku. Yes, our our favorite listener. <laughs> well, our favorite listener in terms of providing feedback as well. Yes. Yes. Um, okay, so he has feedback on three episodes. First one is uh, episode 44 around, uh, that was Pipe Wire, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and he found the interview with Tim Wayman's fascinating and informative. So for some reason, there is a fact around the world record for solving the Rubik's Cube because the guy had a similar name to Wim, um, <laughs> which is 5.09 seconds, apparently, which is <laughs> my record in, when I was uh, I don't know, 14, 12, uh, was something like 45 and, seconds. So that's, yeah, and this is known as a fun fact, of course. <laughs> yes, fun fact. Um, okay, so on episode... 45 um he had a <laughs> quite a nice comment actually uh, never before did i think that the matrix can be any good without neo but you proved me wrong interview with neil johnson was good there you go. thank you Biko. Indeed. so um, if you if you can drag neo along we are more than happy to do a, to yeah. do a rerun of the matrix episode <laughs> resurrections or not good thinking yes okay if you're listening neo Get in touch. Um, well, of course, he's listening. or Trinity for that matter, because yes, as, yes. I, as I said previously, we are not gender biased. Very no. important. Okay, so final uh, bit of comment from BQ is on episode forty-six, and he has um, an interesting comment here, saying that this type of content that sets this is the type of content that sets the Linux apart from the other Linux-related podcasts and make it quite unique. Um, not sure if it's good or bad, but <laughs> it's, it's good. I think it's good. You know, but, yeah, I'm wrong. yeah. From our point of view, it's good. Obviously, yes. So, uh, really, really educational and informative, and so on. Um, this was the PVP uh, episode, and um, uh, he has some comments on our dark side text port. Um, which he says he's missing. Yes, yes. So, why, why don't you read this up? Because it's worth yeah, it. Yeah, Even okay. though I think Margaret Thatcher has died already. Margaret Thatcher reminded me of that amazing Dark Side tech support episode featuring Liam, I think, and the election results. That was, but, and that was the <laughs> first Dark Side episode. Yes, yes. It was. yes it was. Very important. That was where Dark Side became a part of the Mac, B important, and C eternal, I'm tempted to add. Yes. Anyway, he's asking for more dark sides. So, so how much money did you give him? Uh, we don't. Like quite a lot, right? Uh, <laughs> or did marketing do that deed? <laughs> well, I'm missing something I'm just here. <laughs> <laughs> That's like an interesting business model. They sponsor your business. <laughs> no, Martins, do spill the beans. <laughs> yes. Um, anyway, he says keep up the good work, so. Thank you, BQ. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. There was another comment about the pronunciation of Gitty or Git T or Guy T or etc. But it can all be um, solved by visiting the website where it is explained how it is pronounced. Yeah. It may be Gitty, it may be Gitty, I do not know. Well, the website so says Gitty, Gitty, Gitty are people, uh, if you have, if you have <laughs> a thought of this, you have a feedback and little silos out of you. Indeed. And okay, so that was with that, with that we, yeah, be, before we go into the boxes, need to say, okay. jokes aside, um, anybody listening, insects, okay, anybody uh, listening, <laughs> animals, <laughs> females, diverse, uh, yeah. neutral, neutrons, yeah. is that what I'm looking for? Men, fe- it doesn't matter, men, men women alike, diverse, mm-hmm. whatever, do send feedback to feedback at Linux Indoors or you. If you want to send us money, it's, I'm almost tempted to say Patreon, but pay- I haven't set up the Patreon account yet. So just send uh, an email to sponsor at We we will get in touch. <clears throat> and with that, onto the boxes, Martin. What's your box? Uh, my box is, uh, uh, I guess it's. I have to say, um, Ma- let me guess, Margaret Thatcher. No, no. Oh, actually, I have more. Than Queen one. Elizabeth. On one, which one shall I choose? Interesting. Prince, what's what's his name again? Andrew. The philanthropist? No, 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 Prince no, Charles. No, no monarchies involved. Since you're monarchies, exactly. 
Um, you're disappointed. I, I, it's, it's hard to choose, actually. Uh, so many, so many topics to choose from. No, even, I def- even after the. Let, uh, let me uh, guess, Prince Harry, the breakaway. Is he still a prince? I do not know. <laughs> you tell me. He came out. <laughs> I don't, I don't well, it. apparently he has married outside the whatever, what's the word of for gentry? Maybe not. <laughs> and much more importantly, he has defected to a breakaway nation called the US mm. of A. Not if I'm completely colony. mistaken. <laughs> yeah, from a colony, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, all very um, disappointing. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing. But hey, what do I know about royals? More than I do, by the sound of it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. I'll, have, I'll go. I'll have go, you, go I'll have you cancelled your hello subscription? I wonder, Martin. I don't have one. <laughs> Uh, you, 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 can, never had one. you can, Martin. You can tell the truth. The last time I visited you, you had it on your table. Uh, you had your, you had it on your coffee tables. Uh, ah, coffee you table. it with you. But, <laughs> yeah, but you see, that was only that was only the last twenty years. Also, I was your plane reading, <laughs> reading on the plane. <laughs> you see, I never ventured into your into your into your cellar to discover the backlog. So I don't know. Excellent. <laughs> no, you don't want to go there. That's, uh... No, I don't. That's it. <laughs> Okay, back to the boxes. Back to the boxes. Yeah, I'm gonna go with uh, with Reacher actually. With what? Reacher. Reacher. Yeah. Jack Reacher. It's a series on. Um, uh, ah, it's a bit like what uh, Tom Clancy like, but it's not by Tom Clancy. But Jack Reacher. Yes. Um, Why don't you enlighten the few listeners who do not know who that is about the details? Okay. It's some, uh, it's some sort of cheap action serial. Well, you may you're probably familiar with Tom Cruise, right? Oh dear, <laughs> um, Tom Cruise is not in it um, because it's not a, a movie; it's a series. So, so I'm a Tom Cruise is a series. I thought it was an individual. No, 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 no. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> no, Tom Cruise is not in the series called Reacher, but he ah. did make the movies. Um, with Jack Reacher as the main character. I see. Uh, and these okay. are based on books by a writing person. <laughs> like an author? <laughs> yeah, that's so excellent, awesome. excellent, excellent, excellent. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, but yeah, the new, new series is ah, it's quite amusing. It's uh, light entertainment, let's put it that way. Um, but oh, dear. It's, okay. It's entertaining, yeah. So how many IMDb stars we're looking at? Two? Maybe three? Oh. It, uh, I don't get it's light and tame because, if, 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 because they're because reliable, if you ask me. If you, they're, they are or they're not. I thought there was crowd intelligence work at work. No? Oh, no, but they go by the... Um, uh, th- this is the thing about anything uh, ratings-based, right? You get ratings from people who, who rate things, uh, good or bad. <laughs> And not and general ratings, average yes. people that don't <laughs> that don't give ratings, so you, you end up with a biased view of a of, of a rating, unfortunately. So, Martin, that means you have finally rev- a, revamped your bots and b improved them. Therefore, ignore all ratings or reviews, <laughs> especially if and, done and by and bots from Martin. <laughs> You kept your own mind and decisions on these things. <laughs> I see. Okay. Uh, okay. In that case, what about yours? Yeah. Uh, yes. In that case, basically, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna refer to a movie too. It's called oh. Comeback Trail. As Martin said, ignore, ignore the ratings on IMDb. I think it clocks in at six or seven. I would give it an eight, to be honest with you. Robert De Niro. Yes, that's exactly it. Right. Robert, Robert De Niro plays a failing uh, producer who comes up with the idea of making some money that he uh, uses or will use to pay back to pay back a mobster, and he does so by coming up with the idea of doing one last gig, as in producing one one last film. Uh, not with the intention of putting this onto a silver screen, but rather cashing in on the insurance premium of one of the main actors dying. Right. And as part of the movie production. This is an accidental death, is it? So... Uh, yes, funny <laughs> enough. 
<laughs> no, it, it's it's it's, it's, it's one of the best one, is it? <laughs> it's no, it's one of the most. I mean, yeah. I mean, you're looking at at Robert De Niro uh, as 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 a producer. Where you're looking at what is it? Um, uh, it's not Thompson, but uh, have him out here. If you're looking at the, at the IMDb page already. What? What's the question? There's the 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 antagonist is is uh, Hunter Thompson. No, it's not. Hunter. That's an author. Um, Tommy Lee Jones, Morgan Freeman. No, 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 no. Uh, let me look up myself. IMDb, and it's I don't want the tip of my tongue. Oh. About a minute ago, it's Tommy Lee Jones, of course, playing the actor. Soon to demise. Same. Now, of yeah. of course, this Famous this death, sorry, famous for uh, quite a few movies. I'm tempted. I'm tempted to. Add. Right. No, uh, to, you don't know Tom Lee Jones. No, no, no. I'm I'm, I'm asking the question. What's what's he most? No, famous? I mean, no. It's it's. I mean, you're looking at what? Man in Black. Yes. Best example. That's the one. Yeah. Well done. Just checking. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, no. What I'm, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm, what, I'm, what I was trying to say before Martin rudely interrupted me. <laughs> Jokes aside, no. Uh, it's, it's it's one of the it's one of the best darkest comedies that I've seen over the last couple of years. I'm tempted to. Uh, it's uh, just just a few highlights. The film starts off with. Uh, um, with 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 uh, Robert De Niro and his sidekick, essentially his nephew, sitting in front of a cafe, and a couple of nuns are protesting in front of a cinema against his last movie that tanked. And then they come up with this idea, or then Robert De Niro comes up with this idea of uh, actually recruiting. A an actor that is uh, soon to to be to be sunset anyway. So they go into this retirement home and just try to pick an actor. And without further spoilers, needless to say, Tommy Lee Jones doesn't die, but rather. But that, I think that passes as a spoiler, actually. <laughs> okay, so but okay, <laughs> watch the movie yourself. Uh, Tommy Lee Jones doesn't die, neither does the character that he portrays. Uh, just watch the movie. They all have so, live happily um, ever after. <laughs> exactly. Well, more or less, anyway. <laughs> and of course, if you are if you are a fan of Morgan Freeman, he's also in that movie as 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 the mobster. Many the who other basically, yeah, who, of movies. <laughs> yeah, who Robert De you Niro know, actually owes the money to. Okay, cool. Sounds good. And that's pretty much it for my pick. As I said, don't miss this. It's it's very funny. Good. Alrighty. And, and uh, with that, and... we are almost done, right? Almost. Yes. Oh. Have we missed something? No. Oh. Okay. And then we're done, yes. Well, then Excellent. <laughs> very <laughs> good. Thanks for listening, as usual. And see you, next time. See you soon. This is the Linux in-laws. You come for the knowledge. But stay for the madness. Thank, Thank you, you for, for listening. listening. This podcast is licensed under the latest version of the Creative Commons license. Type attribution share like. Credits for the intro music go to Blue Sea Roosters for the song Salute Margaret. To Twin Flames for their piece called The Flow used for the segment intros. And finally, to Celestial Ground for the song Sweet Justice, used by the Dark Side. you find these and other ditties licensed under CC at Chimando, a website dedicated to liberate the music industry from choking copyright legislation and other crap concepts. <laughs> You've been listening to Hacker Public Radio at hackerpublicradio.org. Today's show was contributed by an HBR listener like yourself. If you ever thought of recording a podcast, then click on our contribute link to find out how easy it really is. Hosting for HBR is kindly provided by anhonesthost.com. 
the Internet Archive and rsync.net. Unless otherwise stated, today's show is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 3.0 license.